Have you ever experienced the sharp pang of betrayal? It's a taste of bitterness that lingers long after the deed is done, leaving wounds as deep as the ocean's abyss. In my journey, alongside my closest companion Mason, we unraveled a tangled web of deceit spun by our own spouses, Harper and Emily. Through solidarity and brotherhood, Mason and I braved the stormy seas of betrayal, resolute in our quest to expose our wives' infidelity and reclaim justice. This is my tale. Mason Ward was a familiar face, not intimately close, but near enough for a casual cup of coffee and conversation, despite our year-long hiatus. Serendipitously, Mason's wife, Emily, and my own Harper were scheduled to embark on a week-long Caribbean voyage the following morning. Since Mason couldn't secure time off from his job to accompany them, Harper suggested I stay home with our children so that she and Emily could relish their coastal getaway together. She reasoned I'd be an awkward third reel, and they could economize by sharing a cabin. Though hesitant, I relented without protest. It was a decision with predictable consequences. Dylan, I'm sorry you couldn't manage a break from work for the brigade. I was eagerly anticipating it. Mason lamented. What in the world? I did manage it. I've taken a week off, planning to spruce up the kitchen while the ladies are off gallivanting. I confessed. Harper insisted you couldn't get time off. Mason replied, incredulous. But pal, I work for my father. I can take leave whenever I please. I was just about to set off when Emily dropped the bomb about you not being able to join, I explained. In that moment, Mason and I exchanged a wordless glance, realizing our wives had orchestrated a deceitful scheme to abscond with the vacation, leaving us in their wake. Care for some coffee? I proposed and before long, we found ourselves spending the next 2.5 hours at McDonald's. It didn't take much deduction for us to realize that our wives had schemed to embark on a seven-day Caribbean cruise sans us. The looming question remained, what drove their decision? We skirted around the glaring issue until we could no longer avoid it, akin to the well-known metaphorical elephant in the room. Taking the lead, I broached the uncomfortable subject. So Mason, are they rendezvousing with two men or planning to meet strangers? He hesitated, seemingly reluctant to explore the unsettling possibilities. Dylan, care for a pastry. He deflected, not intentionally sidestepping the question, but clearly seeking a momentary reprieve. I nodded in agreement, grabbing my empty coffee cup five minutes later. With two freshly baked buns and steaming cups of coffee before us, Mason voiced his doubts. I can't picture Emily engaging with a stranger. We might need to arrange some sort of preplanned encounter. Reluctantly, I concurred, pondering why they would opt for such elaborate schemes when finding companions locally seen simpler. Perhaps I conceded. I'll be honest, I've never felt the need to keep tabs on Emily's actions or whereabouts. I've always trusted her and never imagined she'd be involved with someone else. Why would two mothers with school-aged children even entertain such thoughts? We attempted to take a sip of our coffee, only to find it scorching hot, prompting us to set our cups aside and gaze out the window. Dylan, it's likely a couple of men from their workplace, Mason surmised. Harper and Emily both worked at life insurance, so Mason's deduction sounded reasonable. Mason, if they're comfortable enough with these men to go on a cruise, we might already be too late to intervene. What can we possibly do? I questioned, a hint of desperation in my voice. He pondered for a moment before responding, what if they've already crossed that line of infidelity? I winced at the possibility. Mason rose from his seat and made his way to the service counter. Upon his return, he muttered, can you believe it? 30 cents for a glass of ice. Why did we even choose this place? We each added some ice to our scalding coffee in silence. Dylan, now that I reflect on it, Emily's been putting in extra hours lately, evenings and weekends, Mason observed. I hadn't thought much of it until now. I confessed, realization dawning on me. I won't stop Harper from going, but I won't just stand by either, I declared, finishing my pastry and disposing of the remaining coffee. Mason, let's reconvene here tomorrow after the girls head to the airport. We need to strategize and be careful not to give anything away to Emily. 
We don't want her suspecting anything. I cautioned as I headed for the door. Mason gave me a thumbs up, indicating his agreement, though his demeanor hinted at his discontent. It seemed he intended to stay and finish his coffee, lost in his own troubled thoughts. Upon my return home, everything appeared typically mundane. Aiden, our eight-year-old, and Elliot, our nine-year-old, were glued to the television screen. I couldn't help but feel they should be outdoors, but I had long abandoned that hope. Harper carried on with her usual demeanor, while I settled in to skim through the newspaper as she prepared a belated lunch. Anticipating a discussion about her upcoming trip, I found Harper curiously evading any mention of it. This avoidance piqued my interest in itself. After lunch, I finally managed to call the boys outside for a game of soccer, while Harper bustled about indoors, packing her belongings. She insisted on being fully prepared for her departure in the morning. Smiling to myself, I stole a few glances back at the house. How had I missed these signs? How naive I had been not to suspect anything sooner. Aiden, Elliot, while their mother's away next week, I'll be occupied with painting the house. What do you think about spending that time with Grandma and Grandpa? I proposed. Their eyes lit up, and within 15 minutes, they were eagerly packing their bags. My parents owned a farm just 35 miles outside town, complete with horses. It wasn't too hard to convince them. Harper grumbled a bit, but didn't seem inclined to put up much of a fuss. When I arrived home, dinner was already on the table, courtesy of my wife. After freshening up, Harper headed for a shower, providing me with a fleeting opportunity to discreetly inspect her bags. My suspicions were swiftly confirmed as I noticed three telling items. Firstly, her choice of sleepwear seemed peculiar, especially considering her plans to spend time with Emily. The second cause for concern was the discovery of a vibrant orange bikini cleverly tucked away in her makeup bag. However, the most unsettling discovery was the catch of 30 packs of condoms stashed in a case. I couldn't help but wonder why my wife would pack such items for a cruise. I chided myself for even allowing such thoughts to surface. Harper had mentioned her desire for a restful night's sleep before the trip, while I opted for an action movie marathon. Unfortunately, my cell phone lacked international coverage, unlike Harper's work phone, which she assured me had global connectivity. Although I couldn't reach her directly, she promised to check in daily or reach out if any issues arose. I reassured her, explaining that if she couldn't reach me, I might be at my parents' house with the boys or engrossed in painting. My response seemed to ease her mind as I dropped Harper off at the terminal, where Emily awaited her with a beaming smile and a wave. Anticipation bubbled within me as I awaited Mason's arrival. As soon as I parked, he approached us, armed with a couple of coffee cups, grumbling about the ice situation. Please, Mason, tell me you've got some good news, he pleaded, his hope palpable. Regrettably, I could only shake my head in the negative. To worsen matters, Emily had packed two new dresses and lingerie that would likely embarrass most women. Adding to my unease, I stumbled upon a new bikini and a substantial stash of condoms. The thought hadn't even occurred to me to search her makeup bag. I grappled with conflicting emotions, torn between relief at not finding anything incriminating and regret for not conducting a more thorough search. Mason, and I spent the next 15 minutes commiserating over our shared predicament. Once our coffee cups were drained, it was time to shift our focus to business. Our initial stop was life insurance, where we informed the receptionist of our need to speak with Anthony Gray, the head of human resources. Mason and I had known Anthony since high school. While we weren't particularly close, we got along decently. Unfortunately, Anthony's expression upon seeing us suggested he wasn't exactly thrilled. Could you please shut the door? I requested as Mason, and I settled into the uncomfortable chairs. Do you understand why we're here, Anthony? I inquired, trying to keep the mood light. Mason and I exchanged knowing smiles, but Anthony's expression remained sullen. I have a pretty good idea, Anthony replied, his tone serious. Our smiles faded into frowns as we waited for his response. Anthony's demeanor swiftly shifted as he began typing on his computer. After a moment, he sighed and mentioned Harper and Emily. Thirteen employees are on vacation, Anthony stated. 
Can you print out a list for us? I asked. No, but I can provide you with the necessary information. Anthony replied, typing a few more commands. The printer beside him worked to life, producing two sheets of paper, which he handed to us, awaiting our reaction. Mason and I quickly scanned through the documents before turning back to Anthony. These two individuals, Henry Perry and Lucas Long, are on the same cruise as Emily and Harper. There's no need to see the rest of the list, I concluded. That was the extent of your inquiry, purely out of curiosity. Do you know the pairings? I asked, sliding a photo of Lucas in front of Mason and another in front of myself. Anthony hesitated before responding, clearly struggling with his answer. Eventually, he relented. I was under the impression the company had a policy against such situations, I remarked, seeking clarification. Yes, but it's only enforceable if there's an official complaint, Anthony explained. And then, I pressed further. Typically just a warning, Anthony admitted. Mason and I exchanged a meaningful glance, communicating volumes without uttering a word. We were in unanimous agreement. Anthony, if those four individuals are still employed here next week, we will pursue legal action, I asserted firmly. We don't have all the details yet, but it's inevitable. Our attorney will be in touch with you or your legal department, depending on your preference, Mason added. Anthony nodded, understanding the gravity of the situation. I apologize for this unfortunate circumstance. We refrained from taking any action as the relationship was consensual and no complaints were lodged until now. But yes, it's official. You terminate all four of us or you can expect a lawsuit one that will garner significant public attention, I declared firmly. Before we departed, Mason and I made our stance clear. We shook hands with Anthony, signifying the conclusion of our discussion. As we exited through the main entrance, Mason glanced at me, a silent acknowledgement of the weight of our decision. So, what's our next move? Mason pondered aloud. I believe our best course of action is to meet with the lawyer first, I suggested. Then we can grab lunch and head to the local travel agency. As we parked the cars and made our way towards the lawyer's office, Mason suddenly stopped in his tracks. I glanced at him puzzled. What's wrong? I asked. Dellen, what exactly are we hoping the lawyer will do for us? Mason questioned suddenly. I furrowed my brow, considering his words. Well, I suppose once we step through that door, it's going to come with a hefty price tag and all we'll be left with is a lighter wallet, I admitted. We'll likely end up divorced, free from those unfaithful women. I continued, urging Mason to contemplate the consequences. But think about it. We'll be obligated to pay alimony, continue making mortgage payments, surrender custody of the children, and subsequently pay child support. All the unpaid bills will be dumped on us, and the court might even mandate providing our wives with credit cards and cell phones. And by the time it's all said and done, we'll still be expected to finance our children's college education. And what to be gained from it? Nothing, as far as I can see. Why would any rational person choose to get a divorce? The only reason I can think of is to maintain contact with their children. It's the entire trade-off, Mason reasoned, frustration creeping into his voice. Damn it, Mason, I love my kids. I don't want to lose them. I confessed, feeling the weight of the situation pressing down on me. I understand exactly how you feel. I'd be devastated if I couldn't see my daughters again, Mason admitted somberly. But I don't want to suffer financial ruin simply because my wife was unfaithful. After the recent events, it seems like the most just course of action would be to have custody of the children and hold our spouses accountable. However, it's highly unlikely that such a resolution will ever come to pass, isn't it? I can't shake the feeling that we're being coerced. I expressed the frustration evident in my voice. Both of us stood silently in the parking lot, contemplating the unjust laws that seemed to tie our hands. Dylan, who's responsible for creating these unfair laws? Mason questioned, echoing my sentiments. As we turned and headed back to our respective cars, I couldn't help but admit, Mason, I have to acknowledge that Harper is an exceptional mother. If I ever had children, 
I doubt I could match her level of competence. Mason nodded in understanding. The same can be said for Emily. Despite her actions, she's a devoted mother, and the girls adore her. It pains me to admit it, but she would likely be a better parent than I could ever be, he confessed reluctantly. Despite the betrayal we both experienced, neither of us spoke further. Leaning against the hood of my car, I absentmindedly kicked at the gravel beneath my feet, while Mason fiddled with the zipper on his jacket. Dylan, would you like to grab some ribs? Mason suddenly suggested, breaking the heavy silence between us. We shared a full portion, indulging in three beers each to pass the time. Eventually, we switched to coffee and savoured servings of coconut pudding as we continued to seek solace in each other's company. Once we had regained enough sobriety to drive, we made our way to the renowned Your World Travel Agency, owned by Polly Hill, an old family friend who had, unfortunately, transitioned into a former family friend. Within our social circle, everyone depended on Polly's expertise to plan their trips, and it was loyalty alone that had kept her business afloat amidst the onslaught of online competitors. As we stepped into the agency, the expression on Polly's face spoke volumes without her needing to utter a word. Mason and I exchanged smiles as we took our seats, observing the figure who had unwittingly become the instrument of our downfall. The other two agents, seated beside Polly, promptly excused themselves for lunch, one of them clutching a brown bag that seemed out of place on his desk. It was evident that everyone in the office was aware of the situation and attempting to distance themselves. We waited in silence, refraining from any conversation. Polly attempted to find comfort in her chair, but her unease was palpable. Eventually, unable to contain herself any longer, she spoke up, How may I assist you, gentlemen, today? Mason and I exchanged a knowing glance, struggling to stifle a giggle loud enough for Polly to hear. Leaning in closer, I spoke in a hushed tone, You have a mere ten minutes to divulge everything, or we'll make such a commotion that the authorities will have no choice but to treat your office as a crime scene. Polly attempted to diffuse attention. Come on, gentlemen, cut me some slack. I won't disclose anything more than what your wives have already shared with you. You wouldn't do anything foolish, would you? Mason stood up abruptly, turning towards the entrance of the office, his actions signaling our resolve. Two other agents and a couple planning a trip were present in the office. Listen up, everyone, I addressed the room. I suggest you vacate the premises for a few minutes as we'll be rearranging the furniture. Della Mason, hold on, Polly interjected, her tone cautious. All right, what on earth do you want? Just don't get me or the office into trouble. I don't need any unwanted attention, she implored, revealing the franchise's delicate situation. Mason gestured for everyone to relax and settle back into their seats. Polly, who else is accompanying Harper and Emily? I pressed, my urgency apparent. Dylan, there are more than a thousand passengers on the ship. You understand that? Polly replied, attempting to deflect. I'm asking who else from international casualty is on this ship. I clarified my patience wearing thin. I can't disclose that. Polly maintained her stance. In which rooms are Harper and Emily staying? I demanded. They have reservations for room 214 on the sunset deck, Polly replied, but I was unsatisfied. That's not what I ask, is it? I snapped. Damn it, Polly, in which rooms are Lucas and Henry staying? Polly hesitated momentarily, her concerned expression matching her slight stammer. Just as I slammed my fist on the desk, Polly and the other two agents sitting up front jumped back in surprise. The two clients silently got up and walked away. Damn it, Polly, what room are those two in? Answer me now and stop playing games, I demanded fiercely. I swear I'll tear this place apart if I have to. Lom and Perry are in room 217 on the sunset deck. Polly uttered the answer, her voice trembling audibly. Mason leaned across the table, locking eyes with Polly. Lucas is sharing a room with my wife, Emily, he stated firmly, causing Polly to tremble and attempt to push her chair away from the table. In response to your inquiry, Emily and Lucas are indeed sharing a room, evident from Lucas's frustrated strike on the tabletop. 
it's confirmed that both Emily and Lucas occupy room 214, while Harper and Henry are in room 217. However, it's essential to note that I am not the one responsible for this arrangement. It was instructed by someone else. Polly abruptly halted her sentence, realizing she had divulged too much information. She then retrieved the requested documents and handed them over to us. It was challenging to discern if she had shed tears. As we prepared to leave, I turned to her, emphasizing the importance of not contacting anyone on the ship or elsewhere regarding our presence or our conversation. I warned her that such actions would result in dire consequences for her business. Exciting the building, Mason expressed uncertainty about how we would proceed. I admitted that I had no concrete plan. It had simply seemed like a good idea at the time. Mason made the decision to leave his two daughters, Anne and Sophia, in the care of his sister, Victoria, who also had two teenage girls. Once everything was settled, he intended to join us at the house. We spent the evening poring over brochures and schedules, an activity that helped solidify our plan. Acknowledging the irreparable state of our marriages, our focus shifted to the well-being of our children. We cherished them deeply and contemplated the impact of divorce on their lives, particularly our respective roles in their upbringing. We mutually decided to forego official divorce proceedings, opting instead to independently determine our children's care arrangements. I harbored hopes that once the dust settled, I could arrange to live with Harper and the children. While I vowed to meet their basic needs, I had no intentions of financially supporting Harper. Such arrangements demanded meticulous planning and effort, with my ultimate aim being to cover their college tuition. Tonight, however, we needed to address immediate concerns. Thankfully, the cruise ship provided complimentary Wi-Fi, allowing Mason to bring his laptop and download contact information for our friends, relatives and co-workers, including addresses, phone numbers and email addresses. Though handling cell phones remained a challenge, we decided to set that aside for the moment. Currently, the cruise ship was scheduled to arrive in Montego Bay. Wednesday morning arrived, and we were able to secure an affordable sightseeing flight that would arrive in Jamaica by 7.30 a.m. on that very day. Booking a room for the duration of the cruise turned out to be much simpler than expected. It took less than an hour to arrange the flight to Jamaica and reserve a room for our return journey. Harper called and left a message, informing us that they had settled into their cabin without any issues and were already at sea. She requested me to inform Mason that Emily was also on board. As the evening approached, we were nearly ready to depart. Our plan for the following day was to spend most of our time organizing our financial and personal matters, including bank accounts, bills, credit cards, and personal belongings. I intended to take all my belongings to my parents' house for safekeeping while Mason's brother would look after his possessions. Luckily, a kind colleague allowed us to park our cars at his place and gave us a ride to the airport. Although departing at midnight was not ideal, it was necessary. The airport was only a short taxi ride away from the cruise ship parking lot. As we watched the sun set behind the market stall, all we had with us were two carry-on bags and Mason's laptop. We didn't plan on dressing up, so we brought only the bare minimum of clothing. Just 15 minutes later, people began disembarking from the ship. Some headed straight to the town centre, while most made their way to the waiting tour buses in orderly fashion. Everything appeared meticulously coordinated, as if it were a routine affair. Harper and Emily strolled along the walkway with wide smiles, while the two gentlemen behind them, Henry and Lucas, exuded equal delight as they intertwined their hands. They were attractive men, perhaps a few years younger than Mason and me, but certainly not lacking in charm. From our small stools, we watched until they all boarded the bus bound for Duns River Falls. Mason greeted the ticket collector with a wave, exchanged a few words with the driver, and then joined us. Jamaicans are known for their bargaining skills. It took us about 10 minutes to convince him to assist us, along with the payment of $1,100. Identifying Harper and Emily to our newfound acquaintance posed no difficulty, and he gladly agreed to capture as many photographs as possible of the two couples at the falls. When we requested slightly more daring pictures, he grinned and gave us a thumbs up. 
The bus was scheduled to return at 2.50, and we assured him that we would wait with the agreed payment. He smiled once more and emphasized the quality of his camera, subtly hinting at an additional fee of $250 beyond the value of the $55 camera. Once the bus departed, we boarded to settle into our room for an additional $130. The accommodating clerk registered us under the names Noah Scott and Oliver Allen. If all went smoothly, we would remain incognito for the remainder of the cruise. We quickly grabbed a bite to eat, consisting of sandwiches, and then spent the rest of the day familiarizing ourselves with the layout of the ship. In just a couple of hours, we became acquainted with all the stairs, elevators, and passageways on the ship. Our plan was to steer clear of the dining room and showroom to avoid any accidental encounters with our wives. Mason set up his laptop and ran some tests, and thankfully, we encountered no issues with internet access or email. Although we briefly entertained the idea of entering our wives' rooms, we ultimately decided against it. Comfortably seated in the same booth as before, we noticed the buses beginning to return, with the one to Duns River Falls arriving promptly as scheduled. Mason and I were enjoying a couple of glasses of Red Label when Harper, Emily, and their companions walked past us. Our straw hats likely helped conceal our identities to some extent. Our ticket collector approached us, grinning from ear to ear with evident joy. He couldn't wait to showcase his work, enthusiastically boasting about his excellent photography skills. However, Mason interrupted his enthusiasm by handing him a cold beer. With just a quick glance at the photographs, we realized they captured far more affectionate moments, embraces and kisses, than we had anticipated. I handed him $1,100 and another beer for the driver. After ensuring that the wives had safely left the boarding area, we made our way back to the cabin. We had a packed evening ahead, but our first task was to find a discreet way to have dinner. Luckily, the cabin had a balcony overlooking the entrance to the main dining room. Mason and I settled into comfortable seats, with a view of the passengers lining up for their meals. We speculated that the wives would opt for an early dinner, giving them more time for evening activities such as dancing and entertainment. It didn't take long before the four of them arrived and joined the queue. They walked hand in hand, appearing every bit the happy couples. Mason shot me a puzzled look as I rose from my seat and headed to the service phone. Within 40 seconds, I returned with a wide grin on my face. Just as the couples were about to be seated, an announcement rang out. Attention Mason Ward, please join your party on the tea deck. Mason Ward. It wasn't overly loud or intrusive, but it caught everyone's attention. Emily immediately turned her head, as if she could hear the announcement loud and clear. She stepped aside to let the next group of diners pass by. Emily and Harper engaged in an animated conversation, while Henry and Lucas patiently stood to the side. Suddenly, Emily reached for her cell phone and dialed a number from her speed dial. After 40 seconds, she shook her head, indicating no answer. Following suit, Harper made a call, but hers went unanswered as well. Concerned, they proceeded into the dining room. Dylan, that was truly impressive, Mason remarked. I would give anything to have overheard their conversation during that meal. Despite how juvenile it may have seemed, we exchanged greetings and then headed to the sunset deck to enjoy tacos and margaritas. An hour later, we returned to our room, ready to begin our work. Today was a crucial day, as we were scheduled to arrive in Cancun. The next morning, our attempts to call home yielded no response, and no one was aware of our whereabouts. Even if they had tried to contact us, whether it was my parents or Mason's brother, there was no way for them to know where we were. We transferred all the pictures from Dunn's River Falls onto the laptop. Some captured all four of us while most depicted couples. A few showed intimate moments, with Harper in a new orange bikini that seemed to have caused a few wardrobe malfunctions on our way to the falls. Each time she giggled. Although a video would have been ideal, we had to make do with what we had. Mason created a college page featuring the best dozen shots, with Henry and Lucas appearing in all of them. Each of us chose our favorite photo, which Mason then included in an e-card. The message simply read, having a great time. 
Wish you were here. By 10.30, we had sent out over 150 emails. I was amazed by the number of friends, family and social contacts we had collectively. Naturally, everyone at International Casualty received a set of photos. The sky deck was incredibly windy and nearly deserted. Mason and I managed to find a quiet, secluded corner where we enjoyed three long-necked beers, reveling in the success of our first day. We had no clue what we would do the next day, but since the page trick had worked so well, we decided to give it another shot. We retired to bed early. The ship offered an abundance of fruit, danishes, and coffee for breakfast. Purposely avoiding the main dining areas and the most crowded common spaces, we utilized the service stairways instead of the elevators. Later, I was enjoying a refreshing rum drink with pineapple and apple on the sun deck at the back. From there, we had a clear view of the main pool, which was gradually becoming more crowded as we sipped on our second drink. Harper and Emily joined us, settling comfortably into a couple of lounge chairs. However, Henry and Lucas were nowhere to be found, leaving us uncertain of what to do. We simply observed from the other end of the deck. There was a bored-looking teenager engrossed in his cell phone. I always found it fascinating how quickly teenagers could send text messages on those devices. I nudged Mason and together we approached the young guy, faced with the challenge of approaching a boy on a cruise ship without appearing strange. It was an awkward situation, but we managed to navigate through it. Eventually, he agreed to let us use his cell phone for a fee of 30 bucks. Hello. Hi Harper, it's Delen. I apologize for not being able to answer your call. Last night, I tried calling home three times. Dallin, your phone indicates you're calling from Norfolk. I'm sorry, but I had to borrow this phone. You know, I can't make calls from mine with everything. All right, Dylan. Your parents had no idea where you were. I'm fine, just busy. Are you having a good time? Yeah, we're having a fantastic time. It's a shame you couldn't join us. All right, please say hi to Emily for me before I let you go. I need to return the phone to its seminar, by the way. I wanted to mention that he looked stunning in that orange bikini. I don't recall seeing it before. Dylan and I burst into laughter as I ended the call and handed the phone back to its owner. Mason and I decided to block Harper and Emily's numbers on their phones. I gave the teenager another 10 bucks and reminded him to keep our encounter a secret. He thought it was cool and readily agreed. Harper and Emily scoured the ship, desperately trying to locate me. Harper attempted to conceal herself with a large towel, as if trying to avoid being noticed. It was a foolish move on her part. She tried calling the number we had used twice, but eventually gave up. Henry and Lucas arrived a few moments later. Mason proceeded directly to the service phone on the sun deck. Shortly after, he returned to the railing with a broad smile on his face. Mason Ward, kindly join your group at the shuffleboard court. The announcement echoed across the deck. Upon hearing this, there was a flurry of activity near the pool. Emily and Harper swiftly gathered their belongings and made their way to the shuffleboard court on the port side of the yacht. Meanwhile, Henry and Lucas simply stood there, appearing displeased. We observed our wives intently from above. They waited for half an hour before departing. As they strolled back to their room, Harper took out her cell phone and made a call. Judging by the expression on her face, we realized that the postcards had arrived home. We were unsure of the person she was speaking to, but it was inconsequential. Everyone who knew us as a couple possessed pictures of Harper and Emily with their boyfriends. They lingered in the middle of the deck for a few minutes, examining the displays on Harper's cell phone before heading towards the cabin deck. Henry and Lucas attended the evening dinner without their female companions. They spent the remainder of the evening indulging in drinks at the cabaret bar on the lagoon deck. Throughout the evening, Mason and I nestled into a secluded corner, relishing beer and pizza while keeping a watchful eye on them. They remained oblivious to our presence. We briefly debated whether to eavesdrop on their conversation by moving closer, but ultimately dismissed the idea. Our wives never showed up, departing the bar in an inebriated state around midnight. Crew members had to assist them back to their cabins. Their sleeping arrangements held no importance to us. The next morning, 
as we enjoyed breakfast on the sun deck, the golden sunrise docked in Cancun. Passengers eagerly gathered on the promenade deck for the day's activities. Unsure of our plans, we hesitated to follow the couples ashore, deeming it imprudent. However, our deliberations were rendered moot as Harper and Emily were among the first to disembark with their luggage, bypassing the day trips and leaving the crews altogether, while other tourists boarded the tour buses. Hailing a cab, they swiftly departed. Mason and I exchanged a final farewell, unprepared for this unexpected turn of events. We had expected our wives to find us sooner or later, given the boat's limited size, but they made no effort to do so. Henry and Lucas disembarked the ship and boarded a tour bus, leaving us uncertain of their intentions. We enjoyed a leisurely lunch in the sparsely populated dining room, with one more stop before returning to Grand Cayman. Strategizing was necessary, and perhaps a relaxed lunch awaited us later, despite most passengers being ashore. Harper and Emily's absence didn't affect the atmosphere, which became more laid-back and enjoyable. The ship was scheduled to depart Canton that evening and reach the Cayman Islands the following afternoon. It seemed like the perfect opportunity for a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Discussing matters with Henry and Lucas was essential, but Mason and I were unsure of what to say. Upon entering the formal dining room, we noticed our wives and their partners had secured a table for four with two empty seats. Mason and I waited until Henry and Lucas were seated before approaching their table and taking a seat. No one objected or questioned our presence. Introductions were made. Good evening, gentlemen. I assume you recognize us, I began. Lucas offered a slight nod, while Henry's expression revealed his displeasure at our arrival. Their reactions varied, with Lucas appearing apprehensive and uncertain, and Henry increasingly agitated. Mason Ward, and I will not be joining you for dinner. With only three days left on the cruise, we felt it necessary to caution you to exercise caution. I continued. I noticed Mason chuckling, but I chose not to acknowledge him. Lucas appeared intrigued, while Henry seemed increasingly agitated. It is worth noting that 230 individuals go overboard on pleasure cruises annually and are never found. After a brief pause for emphasis, Mason and I rose from our seats and exited the dining area. Though we could hear Lucas talking, his words were indiscernible. Opting for tacos and beer for our evening meal, we decided against venturing out onto the deck due to the strong wind. However, the sunset was stunning through the windows of the living room. Well, Dylan, that was quite the spectacle. I'm not entirely sure what you were expecting, but you certainly captured their attention, Mason remarked. I'm not sure I did either. Let's reconvene tomorrow and reassess the situation, I replied. Unfortunately, our plans didn't unfold as expected. As we were discussing, a figure approached us, Mr. Senson, a stern-looking crewman, accompanied by two others. Excuse me, gentlemen, I am Mr. Senson. May I have a moment of your time, please, he requested. Mason and I swiveled our chairs to face him, acknowledging his authority. Am I addressing Mr. Scott and Mr. Allen? Mr. Senson inquired. There was no need for pretense. Yes, that's us, I confirmed. Some of our fellow passengers have claimed that you threatened to throw them overboard. Can you provide an explanation for their allegations? Mr. Senson questioned. No, we did not threaten them. We simply cited statistics on maritime accidents. In fact, we advised them to exercise caution, I responded. It was a subtle warning. And you both know it? Mr. Senson pressed. Why would we do such a thing? I countered. The buddy crewman gestured toward a quiet corner of the room, and we all followed suit. Gentlemen, did you threaten Mr. Long and Mr. Perry? Mr. Senson asked pointedly. Mason and I exchanged glances, silently reaching a consensus on our response. Yes, despite not being phrased as a threat, our words were indeed spoken with that intention. I admitted. Was there a specific reason behind that perceived threat? Absolutely. And you were certainly a contributing factor to that reason. I responded, meeting Mr. Sorensen's expectant gaze. 
Southern Cruises Lines arranged for these two gentlemen to share cabins with our wives throughout the week. Mr. Long was with Mrs. Ward, while Mr. Perry shared a stateroom with my wife. It appears that Southern Cruises is hosting a cruise with entertainment at sea, targeting married women seeking to spend time with their lovers. While I understand that you are likely legally protected from such occurrences, the situation appears quite distressing to me. I continued. Mr. Ward, I empathize with your frustration regarding your wife's actions. But surely, you do not believe that the cruise line endorses or supports such behavior. Mason, and I remained silent in response to his inquiries. Though we had thoughts to share, we opted to remain quiet. At that moment, both of us reclined in our chairs and exchanged knowing smiles. Despite Mr. Sorensen appearing slightly flustered, he maintained control of the conversation. Regrettably, we will need to report this matter to the appropriate authorities. They may have inquiries for you, Mr. Soren stated. Which authorities, you may ask? We are currently at sea. Aren't you the authorities in this situation? Mr. Ward, Mr. Allen, I kindly request that you refrain from interacting with Mr. Perry and Mr. Long for the remainder of the cruise. Can you assure me that you will not cause any disturbances before we reach Miami? Mr. Sorens asked. Mason and I nodded in agreement, smiles on our faces, as the group departed, leaving us alone in the room. That evening, we dedicated ourselves to crafting emails to various media outlets in the region, adding flourishes to the details and even attaching photos that we knew could not be published. The next morning, over a hearty breakfast in the dining area, we noticed the absence of Henry and Lucas. Later, as the ship docked to the Grand Cayman Islands, we passed by their cabins and observed breakfast dishes left outside their doors. Lucas disembarked with his luggage, bidding farewell to the ship, while his maid remained behind. Mason and I decided to spend the day ashore, despite the limited attractions. Nonetheless, we had a delightful time swimming with the manta rays, a rare activity during our trip not driven by thoughts of revenge. In the evening, during another satisfying dinner, Henry was notably absent. I briefly pondered if he had left the ship after us, though I doubted it. Mason received over 30 email responses to the postcards we had sent out, eliciting both lighthearted laughter and stern criticism of our actions as despicable. While we were pleased that our intended audience had received our message and found it amusing, our family members responded with disapproval. Harper and Emily had not sent any messages. Knowing that we would be returning home the next day, we made sure to fully charge both of our phones before retiring to bed. Additionally, we sent out 27 press releases, despite our lack of expertise on how to properly prepare and distribute them. Among the flurry of press releases we sent out, we made sure to direct two of them to Piccolo World Tours the company that owns the Your World Travel Agency franchise. Perhaps we went a tad overboard in accusing Polly Rubburn of orchestrating trips for married women to run Davis with their lovers. We may have exaggerated the situation to drive our point home, but we felt she deserved it. The rest of the story ended up in newspapers and featured on Exposer TV shows. Hopefully, we'll receive some sort of response. It had been a good day, and we had a restful night's sleep. The following morning, we enjoyed breakfast on the tier deck. After finishing, Mason turned on his cell phone. I received a call from my father. Since we had separated and made our initial calls since the journey began, my father expressed concern. Son, it's Dylan. I notice you've been trying to reach me. What's happening? Well, Dad, I assume you have more information about this situation than I do. All I know is that Harper arrived on Wednesday and took the children with her. He had asked me not to allow her to take them, but I couldn't prevent it. Later, I entered the house, but she was nowhere to be found. The front door was unlocked, so I went inside and found most of her clothes and the children's clothes were gone. It seemed like she was in a hurry to leave. She didn't mention where she was headed. Elliot seemed a bit upset about leaving, and I overheard him mention something about Noble's Grove. It seemed to lift his spirits. Harper's sister, Isabella, resides in Nesher. That's likely where she went. I'll try to find her phone number and give her a call, Delan. We received the postcard with the photos. Can you explain what's happening? 
Dad, it's clear now. Harper decided to go on a cruise with a former colleague, leaving me behind to care for the children while she enjoys the company of another man. What do you suggest I do? Did you lock up the house? Yes, that's all I could manage. Mason and I hadn't planned on returning home immediately, but circumstances have changed. I've decided that Harper will stay in the house with the children. I have no idea why she left. What are her plans? I'm not sure yet, but I think I'll be seeing you in a day or so. I'll keep you updated in the meantime. Thank you for calling. As I poured myself a cup of coffee, Mason continued speaking, looking displeased. We both assumed our wives would be returning home to the children, and we intended to stay elsewhere for a few months while we figured out our next steps. Our plan is to seek employment to the Pensacola region. Mason returned with a somber look on his face, grabbing a pastry from the buffet and joining me at the lounge. Wow, you seem as thrilled as I am, I commented. Mason forced a weak smile and sighed. Dylan, she's gone. Emily has left and left the children with my sister. What am I supposed to do? What does she say? I asked. According to Victoria, she hardly said anything. She thanked Victoria for looking after them and spoke to the girls for a few minutes. Victoria mentioned that her car was filled with clothes. I don't know how she found out. She left the kids there. She was alone when she left. What about the house? Victoria's husband inquired. No one was in the house. All the furniture and belongings were still there, but Emily didn't live there anymore. He didn't go inside, but I assume all her clothes are gone. Things didn't go as planned for me either, I admitted. Harper found out that the boys were at my parents' house and took them from there. I think she went to her sister's in Mount Carmel, but I'm not certain. She took all her clothes and the boys' clothes with her. It seems like my house is empty too. We sat in silence for a few moments. Mason looked at me with concern. I know it's early in the morning, but I could use a beer. We spent the remainder of our cruise in the tea lounge, drinking more beer than we were accustomed to. As the ship departed, we walked up to the railing and watched the weary passengers heading home. We didn't see Henry sail, but the place was quite crowded. The friendly bartender informed us that the lounge was now closed, so we made our way back to our stateroom, where we discovered all our belongings packed and lying in the aisle. We were informed that we would be met by authorities to answer for our threatening behavior. We didn't really understand which authorities they were referring to, but it didn't matter. No one escorted us off the ship, and no one was expecting to meet us. It was, to say the least, a letdown. Not that I was disappointed, but we were hoping for a bit of media attention. But none of that materialized. Mason and I took the last two seats in the airport Lima van. The cost of one-way tickets back home without prior notice was incredibly high, but we felt like we had no other option. During the return flight, we hardly exchanged any words. Our plans had gone awry, leaving both of us feeling a bit down. Mason still had his children, but his wife was no longer with him. On the other hand, I had neither children nor a wife coming back to an empty house, which was far from a pleasant experience. There were no signs or messages from Harper anywhere in the house or on our phones. I decided to call her workplace and discovered that she no longer worked at International Casualty. Although I couldn't be certain, I assumed that Emily, Henry and Lucas were no longer employed there either. The rest of the first day was spent cleaning up the house and getting rid of Harper's belongings that she either misplaced or no longer needed. Mason faced a similar situation. All he had left were the memories of Emily's brief visit to bid farewell to her daughters. According to Victoria, Emily cried when she left the house. Both of us cancelled our credit cards and restricted access to our finances. Emily was now a grown woman and capable of taking care of herself. However, Harper had Aiden and Elliot, and I needed to figure out how to provide for them. It saddened me that she had taken them away, but I had to acknowledge that she was their mother and had a responsibility to protect and care for them. It seemed that Emily wasn't confident enough to take that risk, in a way. It was a beneficial arrangement, especially for the children. Mason and his daughters had settled into their new home, and things were gradually returning to normal, as one would expect. Victoria took care of the girls 
while Mason was at work and assisted him with household tasks as much as she could. My life, on the other hand, had completely changed. All that awaited me were evenings spent watching TV and eating microwave dinners. I conducted some inquiries and discovered that Lucas Long had left town immediately after being fired. Henry had also lost his job, but no one knew where he currently worked or resided. I reached out to Harper's sister Isabella in an attempt to find out what had happened to the kids, but my efforts were in vain. Isabella claimed that Harper had stayed for one night and then left without informing anyone of her whereabouts. I didn't truly believe her, but I had no choice but to trust her until proven otherwise. Surprisingly, Mason and I had grown apart. He had a family, or at least a part of one, while I had nothing. I attempted to spend time with him and the girls, but it was always awkward. At the start of the new school year, I visited the administrative office at the boys' previous school. I informed them that I wanted to ensure Aiden and Elliot's school records were transferred correctly. A very kind young lady assured me that the paperwork had been sent to North Hill School in Weisport three weeks prior. She seemed proud to provide me with that information, and I expressed my gratitude. It didn't take me long to discover Harper's new cell phone number. I dialed the number three times before she finally picked up. Calder ID is a useful feature, unless someone is using it to avoid speaking with you. I didn't prolong the conversation. I asked her to meet me at the food court in Weisport Mall. I waited for over 25 minutes for her to arrive. This was our first contact since her romantic cruise, and I was determined not to mention it at all. I had a large coffee in front of me, but had turned cold by the time she sat down at the table. We didn't exchange any words or greetings. Eventually, I had to break the silence. I want you and the boys to return to the house, I said. Harper shifted uncomfortably on the hard plastic seat in the mall. She hadn't grabbed a drink before joining me, so her hands were empty. All four of you together. No, just you and the boys, I clarified. I have a small apartment nearby. The house will be more familiar and comfortable for Aiden and Elliot. They can go back to their old school, and I can see them regularly. I can't afford to live in a house, but I will take care of the rent and utilities. I'll provide you with money for food and other household expenses. I'll also handle the boys' clothing and school expenses. What about me? Harper asked. Well, Harper, you're an adult now. I believe you are capable of managing on your own. I must focus on my work. You can arrange your schedule to work while the boys are at school or in the evenings so I can supervise them. I'm confident you will find something to occupy your time. It was a mix of emotions for her, and I was uncertain about her expectations or what she was willing to accept. Her eyes scanned the mall as if she was pondering or searching for something. I could sense that she saw both positives and negatives in this proposition. Very well. I will do it for the boys, she finally said. You are correct. It will be beneficial for them. When would you like to proceed? I will vacate the premises in the next few days, and you can move in whenever you wish, I replied. The decision had been made. The entire conversation took less time than my weight in that uncomfortable chair. For a brief moment, we both sat in silence. Dylan, is there anything else you wish to discuss? She asked. That was my signal to depart. I promptly rose and placed the empty paper cup on the table. No, I am uncertain, I said. But before I walked away, I believed I noticed a slight tear in her eyes. Upon glancing back, she was still seated there. The following six months passed without any major incidents. Harper secured a job that allowed her to work while the boys were at school. I would leave them at my apartment on weekends, and she would care for them during the week. Mason received a divorce petition from Emily, or whatever it is called. It was sent from Sacramento. His daughters resided with him, and it appeared that they were managing well. I believe his sister and mother were assisting him. Work was progressing better than anticipated. Unfortunately, despite the potential for advancement within the company, the circumstances made me hesitant to make any significant moves. As Christmas approached, everything seemed to fall apart. Upon returning from lunch one day, I was surprised to find Aiden and Elliot waiting for me in the office. What's happening? Why are you not at school? I asked, 
puzzled by their presence. The furnace malfunctioned. We were all dismissed. Aiden began to explain, while Elliot stood quietly, staring at his feet. When did you all arrive here? I inquired further. We returned home first, and then decided to come here. The key was hidden under the mat. You could have come in earlier, they responded in unison, still avoiding eye contact. Sensing that something was amiss, I pressed on. What are you concealing? Elliot, mustering up his courage, joined the conversation. His words spilled out rapidly with a slight stutter. When we arrived home, my mother left her bedroom door ajar. She was inside with that man, Henry. They were unclothed and engaging in intimate activities, like what you see on the internet. I was speechless. How could I possibly respond to such shocking news? Elliot extended his cell phone to me, and with a heavy heart, I glanced at the photos. In a matter of seconds, it became painfully clear that their account was true. Aiden added that Henry had visited the house multiple times, and Harper had instructed them not to disclose his presence. She warned them that if I became upset, they would all have to relocate back to Weisfort. After a few more minutes of conversation, we agreed that the boys should move in with me. I handed them the keys to the apartment and bid them farewell. Then, I made my way to the Human Resources office to address the situation. Bitsmark, North Dakota may not have been a typical vacation spot, but with an immediate job opening, it seemed like the right move. After sorting out some financial matters, I returned home. The house was quiet, indicating that Harper was likely at work. As I loaded the boys' belongings into the car, I realized Henry was still there. Just as I finished, Harper walked in through the front door, clearly surprised. Dylan, what's happening? I thought we had an agreement. Where are you taking all this stuff? She demanded. The agreement is over, Harper. The boys and I are leaving. You can protest all you want, but it won't change anything. You can't keep my boys, I asserted firmly. I won't allow it, and the courts won't either. I'm taking them. If you want custody, you'll have to go to court and explain everything, I added. Harper stood defiantly, hands on hips, with a smirk. I placed the final bag down and turned to face her, determined to stand my ground. What did you have for lunch today, my dear? She inquired, her tone unusually casual. What relevance does that have? Why do you even care? My lunch is none of your concern, I replied, feeling her confidence waver. By the way, the heating system malfunctioned at school today, she added, her demeanor shifting. I'm sorry, I don't understand. The school furnace stopped working this morning. All the students were sent home during lunchtime, she explained, her voice softer now. I repeated my question, hoping for a straightforward answer. But she remained silent, sinking onto the living room couch. I picked up the final bag, pausing at the door before leaving. Elliot took some pictures. I hope Henry has health insurance because he'll need it. I let him off the hook last time, but now he'll have to face the consequences, I remarked, trying to maintain my composure. She didn't react dramatically. Instead, she sat there silently, almost like a zombie. I made a conscious effort not to slam the door, not wanting to disrupt the tense atmosphere. By the end of the week, we had everything packed into a small trailer. I drove past Henry Perry's house, but the owner claimed he had left that day and didn't provide an address. I decided to deal with Henry later. I later learned that she had consulted a lawyer about custody of the boys, but she never reached out to me about it. We settled into our new home quickly, and the boys seemed content, oddly not missing their mother much. About seven months later, I received divorce papers. She didn't ask for anything, and I didn't offer anything either. It always bothered me that she didn't fight for custody of her sons. Though I often think about it, I never bring it up. I believe it's crucial for the boys to have a mother. Next week, I'll begin searching for a mother, and Aiden and Elliot have agreed to assist. Friends, leave a comment on how much you enjoyed this story.